Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, episode number 19. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey folks, this is Dean Vanier with Northwoods Common Sense, and you're listening to my favorite and most informative hunting podcast show on the internet. Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Dusty is on field assignment today, so he will not be joining us on the show. Um, But we have one jam-packed, very informational session here for you today. And you're going to want to take out a notepad and take a lot of notes. And fortunately, you can listen to this over and over. So if you don't have a notepad, don't feel bad. You can just listen to it again and again. Our guest today is Dr. Grant Woods. Dr. Grant Woods is a deer biologist, and he's been studying the white-tailed deer for 30-plus years. He seems to know just about more than anybody I think I've ever met about the white-tailed deer. He, he makes it his life. He studies the deer daily, and he also hunts. And he applies that knowledge to helping other people know more about the white tail to improve their hunting as well. GrowingDeer.tv is his website, and you can go there and read his blog, watch the videos about all the things they do at this place called The Proving Grounds, and Dr. Grant Woods has a fantastic reputation. He he loves to share all the things that he learns about managing deer and growing deer, and he has uh, just passions in life from God, family, and hunting. He is absolutely uh, one of the most passionate people I've ever met about the deer and the white-tailed deer and deer hunting, and he has degrees from Southwest Missouri State, uh, University of Georgia, and Clemson State, and his goal is simply to provide current useful information about deer and deer hunting and deer management in online, on-demand video on his website. Uh, So this man is a giver and a learner, and we get to sit down with him today for one whole hour. So uh, without further ado, Grant, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, we are, we're true fans of yours, uh, Dusty and I, and, and uh, most of our community, I'm sure, will be pleased to know that you're on our show. And we're, uh, we, I've gone to your site many times to learn about deer, and I am absolutely fascinated with everything you're doing. Well, thank you. You know, gosh, I, uh, I've been literally, I guess, in love with deer since I was about in first grade. I found a, a dead female fawn. Poachers had apparently shot it in, in one of our alfalfa fields. I was raised on a farm and there were very few deer in the county. They just started restocking them. And, uh, you know, from that moment on, we bought it up to the barn, skinned it out. And, and I just always wanted to be a deer biologist. I never wanted to be a fireman or a football player. I just wanted to work with deer. That's, uh, it's very cool. It's, um, it's an aspect that, I think every hunter should know more about uh, because of the what we're doing with the woods. I think it's all part of the the plan. Sure, no doubt. You know, in, enjoying uh, the outdoors and and improving it where we can and conserving it where necessary is a uh, is a critical part of I think of what we're what we're doing here on Earth. Absolutely. Now, Grant, where are you from? You know, I'm from uh, Branson, Missouri area, and I currently live here next to Branson, Missouri. A lot of people know Branson because it's a major tourist attraction. It's a, a little town of 12,000 people. You know, we're all to football games on Friday night, uh, but we serve 8 million tourists a year, so a really unique area. Oh, wow. What What is it that draws all the people there? You know, there's three large, uh, beautiful reservoirs, Tabor Rock Lake. I'm sure a lot of folks have heard of Tabor Rock and Bull Shows. Bull Shows is actually the home of... Ranger bass boats and bass tournaments all started many years ago, and uh, and believe it or not, there's more live shows here than in Vegas. It's a uh, it's kind of a you know entertainment capital, I guess. And you know when you live here, you never go to them, so don't ask me anything about shows because I couldn't tell you anything about them. <laughs> well, I'm with you, um, but I think it's cool that you've got a lot going on down there. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Now, how did you first have or develop your interest in deer as uh, a biological specimen? 
you know, of course, I, as I mentioned, I just I found a deer early, and I wanted to learn more about them. And, and quite candidly, the only way I could figure out to, to get paid to play with deer, so to speak, was to keep going to school. And so, uh, of course, I did an undergraduate, and then I did my master's on rub behavior, excuse me, scrape behavior. And, uh, you know, this guy, this is in the mid-'80s, and we really didn't know a lot about scrapes at that time. And I had a, I don't know, a J.C. Penny or something, a home video camera somebody had given me, and batteries are about the size of a 12-volt car battery. And I spent three falls setting up trees. I didn't have enough budget for tree stands, so I'd climb trees, hang on, nail up two-by-fours, whatever I could do, and try to get video footage of deer in scrapes. These were wild free-ranging deer on, on actually public land where hunting was allowed. Hmm. So uh, I'd be out there trying to shinny up the trees and find places where hunters weren't going and, and catch that mystical deer coming to a scrape and, and, and actually got enough footage to make a thesis out of it. And that got a little bit of coverage in, in media and University of Georgia, which is a powerhouse deer school, saw my work. And, you know, this is not something I've really talked much about, but part of that process was actually the invention or at least the improvement of a trail camera. Uh, during that time, I was given a seminar to a Safari Club International, by the way, just trying to raise some money for my research to get my stipend paid or some groceries or something. And right. that guy called me in the back room. You know, I was, of course, green as a gourd out of country and there's a bunch of fancy people sitting around. And I remember so clearly a little kid come up to me after I got done giving my little speech about deer scrape behavior. And so my dad wants to talk to you out in the hallway. Boy, I was scared to death. I thought I'd done something wrong. Somebody going to beat me up or something, you know. And right. I go out there and this guy was an infrared engineer, but he liked to deer hunt. And he said, you know, I, I've been playing with this thing and shoots a beam from one thing to another. And when, it, you know, something breaks it like a deer, it it, it takes a, a camera. Of course, they weren't digital back then. It drives a film camera to take a picture. And I like I like your research. I'd like to give you one. And and so he did. And 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 I started using it. And I and I would call him up. So this is great. But you know, if you could change this or this, it sure helped my research. And and that's really where trail cameras got perfected and came from. Matter of fact, we we published the very first scientific publication on catching deer with a trail camera. No kidding. That's fascinating. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It was funny. And, uh, of course, I'm not very bright because if I had got a patent <laughs> or, you know, done anything, I wouldn't be working as hard as I do now. So I, I just thought it was all fun. <laughs> I did that, you know, totally for fun and thought it was the coolest thing. So right. I took it and made money with it. Right. I just... Uh, you know, biologists start known aren't very savvy when it comes to making money, I guess. But I just thought it was the coolest thing. To, there were little bitty cameras. You may remember they had a little disc in there. They're called disc cameras. And of course, there was no digital or way to look at it on a PC. Right. You barely had a PC. So once a week, I'd drive about an hour away to the closest town that had a one-hour development shop. Yep. And I'd take my little disc up there that you know that the batteries worked on that week. You were limited to 36 pictures, so you didn't dare trigger it yourself. And and I'd stand around and wait for the girls at the Photoshop to to develop these pictures. And they thought I was a blooming idiot, you know, because right. I, I would have, everyone else had pictures of their kids or whatever, and I'd have pictures of, of hopefully a deer, maybe a squirrel or maybe nothing half the time, but <laughs> a deer just, you know, in the middle of the woods to their eyes, to me, that was in a scrape, always had them positioned over a scrape, and, and that, man, I'd get a picture that actually worked, and we'd catch a deer in a scrape, and I'd hoot and holler and jump around, I remember it so clearly, you know, it was just like Christmas every time we got something good. Right. I remember my first uh, deer camera was... Um... Oh, I forgot the name of it, but you, you know how uh, as time goes past, it, it seems like the things that started out huge get smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same yeah. thing with this. I have the, I still have it. It's in my basement. I look at it now and then, and it's, it, it was a giant uh, video camera basically that was triggered by movement. Mm-hmm. And it's about, uh, I would say, you could probably fit six or seven of today's versions inside the sure. box. And that's how big they were. And then I had bought a couple online uh, that they never worked. They were 35 millimeter cameras. Um, a few never worked. There was somebody that had some of the technology with a phone cord plugged in, into the other. And I think I got one picture off of it and then died. And then I kept buying some other ones, and I finally figured it out. And this was in the days of the 35 millimeter, and of course today's technology is just amazing. Oh my gosh, yeah! You can go to the internet and get your pictures zipped right to you, and all that. Yeah, yeah. those were really fun days. I enjoyed those days, and. You know, besides learning about deer and scrapes and who's visiting and what time and all that, I it was really just, I didn't have a bow in my hand, of course, because I was trying to collect enough data for a thesis. And uh, those those three years really taught me more about deer behavior than probably any period of my life. Right, yep. I do remember the days of going into, I think it was Rite Aid, uh, I, would, I would bring my pictures in to be developed, like you were talking about. Sure, And I always, sure. was, I always sat there scratching my head, like, what do these people think of me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> constantly bringing in these pictures, you know, they're half deer, quarter deer, yep. Um, yep. squirrel, yep. you know, all these funny things. And I'm like, uh, 
I spent hundreds of dollars on photography uh, back yep. then. Oh yeah, yep. yeah. Now, yeah. I, I mean, literally, I mean, I mean, there's literally no teasing. And you know, fresh roadkill deer was a staple in my diet back in those days because you know, as a graduate student, I had no money, no, no, not much funding. No one really thought anyone was going to get a project out of try, trying to, you know, take pictures of deer in a little dirt spot out in the woods. Right. And, exactly. Uh, but they were really great days. They were. Those were great days. Now, how did you um, develop into growing? Deer? Your TV. Well, you know, as I mentioned, I went on down to the University of Georgia and actually took that technology and perfected it more and started studying large rubs, you know, like 20 inch rubs, mm. and figuring out which bucks and does were using these rubs and what they were communicating and a lot of stuff like that. And, uh, and while I was going through that research, um, just to be really candid, I was a little nerdy kid that didn't steal pencils from the supply closet and always paid for my copy. So, secretaries like me, and as I was going through my PhD, and and people would call in needing research, some would do it wildlife, usually deer, and it was too small for a university that the secretaries would point in my direction because they liked me because I didn't steal from them and, you know, didn't, wasn't a bad kid. So I just started consulting while I was still in school to, to pay my way through school, basically. And mm. so when I got out, I, I never looked for a job. I had enough clients, I just never looked for a job. And I've, and I've been doing that for 23 years. We've been incorporated 23 years. Is that and, right? And oh, about, no yeah, yeah. So nothing new. And about four or five years ago, a good friend of mine, Bill Winky of Midwest Whitetails, had an online show, and, and we got to talking, and, and Bill and I are still very close friends, but it, it just didn't quite work out. He had his sponsors. I had some groups I was wanting to work with, and so he said, why don't you just do your own show? And, you know, and, I, and I've always been silly, you know, like I thought I could get pictures of deer in a scrape. I thought, well, shoot, I'll just buy a video camera and just do this, you know, so... Uh, we did that, and basically the whole design was just instead of me traveling and consulting, I, I've been traveling about portions of 38 weeks a year for for 20 plus years now. Mm. Instead of traveling all the time, we're just give that information away every week online for free, and see if sponsors will want to be involved. And, and so it was a risk. I wanted. To, I, I'm a homeboy. I want to stay home. My wife and children, and on my land, we've been blessed to own some land here in Missouri, and I want to stay home do research on my own land. And and so that was the old impetus. There was no magic written out model or business plan or it was just a way to, to work with deer and stay home. That's really cool. And I, I like that, that whole concept that, uh, you give out a lot of free content to your, your listeners and, and you grow audience. And hopefully, uh, at some point, there's some sponsors that would love to join in with you. I think that's a very cool concept. It's, it's been very blessed. Gosh, uh, we have literally millions of shows played every year. You know, it's on the web, so you can watch it anytime you want. We put out a brand new show every week. 52 weeks a year for four years now, we've never had a repeat episode. Right. A new show every week. So, you know, we film one week, it's on the air next week, and, and we just film whatever we're doing. If we're doing prescribed fire, or, you know, we're planting a food plot, or we're mixing herbicides, or last week I was blessed to kill a really good buck on my land, a, a seven and a half year old buck that, that is, I, that's, in fact, when I shot that deer at five yards, that's the first time I'd ever seen a deer outside of a trail camera picture. Is that I right? I knew where he was. I knew where he bedded. I, I knew a lot about this deer, and I could not get within 20. I couldn't see the deer. And this year, I just made it my mission. I'm going out. We called him Split Brow. And I'm going after Split Brow, and I'm totally staying out of his area until the pre-rut comes and the wind is perfect. That's and, right. and that's what I did. And, and, in fact, he walked up about five yards from the tree. And, and I'll share with you, it, it was probably the most emotionally draining hunt I've ever been involved in in my life because hmm. I was so happy and so sad because that buck had filled my dreams and frustrated me for years, literally. Right. And, and there's a void now. I mean, I, you know, I don't mind admitting there's a void now. That, that deer's gone. And, and he was seven and a half, so he was going to get gone one or the other. He was actually blind in one eye. He got in a bad fight two years ago, I'm assuming a fight. And he, you know, from two days, I had trail camera pictures, and he's healthy, and then he's all beat up. Gotcha. And he survived that fight, and uh, and two years later, I was able to harvest him. Gotcha. It took a, took a lot of your life for a while, correct? You know, it did. I, I, you know, I'd study maps and I'd think about it. And this is on my own farm. I could walk out my door and you know, right now I'm a quarter mile from where this deer bedded most of his life. And, and, you know, and, and, and these older deer that are, I live in an area that gets a lot of hunting pressure. And if they survive that old, which is rare, you know, they're, they're masters at avoiding predation, two legged or four legged. Exactly. And, uh, and so, uh, and we have a lot of coyotes here. So that's a, you know, deer that live in, in areas with abundant coyotes are super difficult for what I call dumb predators or two legged predators to kill. Cause if you can avoid coyotes, you can avoid man pretty easy. Interesting. Interesting. That's, that's fascinating actually. Very cool. Um, some of the things that, that, that you've learned a lot about deer over the years, correct? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I hope so anyway. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's my that's my passion. That's your thing. What should the common hunter, what's the one thing that we should know um, about deer to make us a more successful hunter? You know, that's a great, 
great point and kind of something I think where my career is going. I spent the first part of my career finding ways and sharing with people how to produce better deer, how to grow better deer. And I neglected for myself and other people how to harvest. And so last four or five years, I've really been focusing on that, not only for myself, but to, to show my clients or other people. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I found is a really common trend as hunters hunt like they're scouting. And, and let me refine that a little bit more. I find when I'm working on properties, stand locations or ground blinds or whatever, where there's the maximum deer sign, a big feeding field or, or, you know, the most deer scat on the property or whatever. They're placing their blinds or their stands where there's the maximum deer sign. And everyone says, well, yeah, of course they are. But no, 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 that's not right. Because where deer spend the most of their time is where they feel the most secure, either in a thick bedding area or in a big open field where they're, they're visiting mainly at nighttime. And you're not, and we know from using GPS collars on deer, I mean, we, you know, we've tracked deer just literally thousands and thousands of miles and thousands of hours. And where where they're the most vulnerable is not going to be where there's the most sign. Where there's the most sign, the wind's going to be swirling or, or they're going to be there at nighttime. Whatever it is, the odds are in their favor. And if you hunt where the odds are in their favor, you're not going to be successful very often. There's always, you know, the brother-in-law that you try to gar ho and you put in the middle of a 40-acre fescue pasture and coyotes chase the big buck out in front of him or, you know, something happens, he kills the biggest buck of the hunt. That that happens. Yep. But but that's the low percentage gig. Uh, and, and so what I've really learned to do and try to teach my clients is I'm hunting what we call the five percent areas. I'm hunting the top of the ridge where the wind's most predictable and the deer's just spending a few minutes or less, just like split brow. I, I shot split brow on the very top of a steep ridge here at my house and he was just crossing. He was coming out of bedding, going towards food and he wasn't gonna, and there was no obvious sign, there's no obvious trail, just from putting a lot of time together and thought, how can this deer go from point A to point B? Because usually where I shoot deer or where I harvest mature deer, there's no trail camera deer because if you're going to check the trail camera every week, you're leaving so much sign, you're alerting deer that hey, this is a bad area to be especially during daylight hours. Hmm. So hunters got to stop hunting like they're scouting. You scout to find the most sign, and then you use your brain to figure out, well, how are they getting from point A to point B and cautiously move in that area and only go there when the odds are in your favor. So I'm trying to find a pinch point around a river or, you know, around a highway or an open cattle pasture, somewhere where deer's going to cross or going to move, and the odds are not in their favor. And that's and the odds are not in their favor, that means I can get in there and hopefully have the odds just enough in my favor to be undetected and, and make the kill. Okay. So you're you're thinking about some kind of a pinch point. You're, is that like a funnel? Is that the, the terminology? That yeah. We're... Funnels, you know, funnels can, can go either way. I mean, okay. you know, a funnel can be pretty long, actually, you know, agricultural areas. And you're going from a CRP field to a, a cut corn field or something. And the funnel may be a, a, a long strip of wood or timber, you know, from point A to point B or something. And within that timber, there's going to be a fence edge or a road edge or a creek or something that pinches the deer down even more. And in and, and that little 40-yard area or whatever, the wind is not in a deer's favor. The, and, and, and you also have an access point that you're not alerting the deer before you get there. You know, you can have the best stand in the world, but if you alert the deer on your way to the stand, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So uh, uh, my definition of a good stand is one that I can approach, hunt, and leave without alerting the deer I'm trying to tag. Okay. Not necessarily alerting the deer because you're going to bust some does and fawns. You know, you, you, if you're in deer country, walking to the stand, you got a chance of alerting deer. Right. Hopefully you kind of got an idea where the deer you're trying to harvest is bedding in this CR field, you know, not in a 10-foot square, but in this general direction, you think the deer is bedding over there and they're moving over here or vice versa. Right. And then I want a point that I can get in there and the deer needs to pass by there, but at that particular point, the odds are not in his favor. So the, the one of the best things to do is to have an access point where you're not going to alert the deer. Absolutely. I mean, if you alert a mature deer, the gig is up. And and a second point I'd like to make sure hunters know is, you know, deer have memory. I, I love it when guys say, well, I'm going to scout during the rain, and that way it'll worse away all my scent. Hmm. And, and that only works if you don't alert any deer while you're scouting, because, you know, maybe you go in, and sure enough, the rain washes your scent away, but that only matters if the deer never got your scent one time while you were scouting. So, you know, deer have memory. We know this, and there's some great research right now at University of Georgia ongoing. I mean, it's not finished, but it's close to it. And the summary of it is they're using color, really high-definition color monitors tied to these feeders that have a padded lid. And let's just say, for example, they teach deer to eat corn when yellow's on the screen. When yellow's on the screen, the padded lid doesn't come down. But if it changes color and they stick their head in there, the pad comes down and stumps them on the nose. Hmm. But, and, and so after a day or two, they learn that every time blue is on the screen, they don't want to go to that corn feeder because it's going to thump them on the nose. And so you, you condition them that yellow is a safe color. And you don't show them for a month yellow. 
and then you put the same deer, we're rotating bunches of different deer in and out. You put the same deer in there, you're flashing different colors, and you flash yellow and see if they walk to the feeder. And it is stunning how well the memory is of a mature deer. Interesting. And how, how lack, how, how little memory a young deer has, which is what we've always thought, but now confirmed that deer learn by experience. They don't just necessarily, they're not just born with this magical way to avoid humans and predators. Right. And, you know, and, and that makes sense. You know, if we didn't take care of our kids, they wouldn't survive at all. And if those does don't help take care of the fawns, especially during the first few weeks, they got no chance for survival. Fawns learn a lot quicker than kids do. Right. Gotcha. What's, uh, it sounds like you do some pretty cool experiments. What's the most shocking revelation you've had um, setting up some of these experiments? Oh, there's some, there's some myth busters that will probably result in arguments in bars all across America for years to come. Here's Perfect. a couple of, you know, this you know deer like are not, hear. yeah, deer are not colorblind. I mean, deer, we, you know, we tie that University of Georgia, some other grad students, I was just grunt labor, but, uh, anesthetized does or some deer, put them to sleep and then tied in electrodes to their optic nerves and then drop their eyelids open. This sounds gross, but it's pretty cool research and flash, you know, the primary, secondary and tertiary colors in there and see which one are getting a left stimulus down to that optic nerve. And unequivocally, deer are not colorblind. They see blues really well. They see pretty deep into the yellow spectrum. Of course, green, you know, I don't know why camel's green because that's what they, they make a living eating green stuff. You know, right. like, you know, I, if I'm walking through the yard and I see a dollar, I pick it up because I've got a search image for a dollar. You know, something that we make a living doing, we're all pretty good at recognizing. And deer make a living off green. They eat green leaves all the time. So green's not my favorite camo color. Uh, but deer, uh, even though deer have, they don't see orange very well. And of course, I wear a hunter orange when I'm out hunting. I, a, I, I don't want somebody shooting me, and B, deer don't see in the orange spectrum very well. So I like orange. It's in the orangey's red zone because deer see yellow really well. I don't want that plasticky orange yellow color. Okay. And, and and so deer are not colorblind. That's one. And then here's a big one. This, this will, you know, someone probably beat me up after this, but... <laughs> I want to say this very carefully. The moon, oh, here it is clearly, folks. The moon has zero to do with when the rut occurs. Zero. Oh, that just hurt a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think a few people are uh, shaking their chairs right now, saying, what, yeah. what Let, is Yeah, let's go to this. Just, uh, matter of fact, I'm just writing about this for a publication. Okay. But uh, we, we took uh, a bunch of researchers, not just one, uh, I think 14 total from a bunch of different universities, pulled their data of actual conception dates of free-ranging wild deer. We had GPS collars on, whatever. You know, we have these cool things, vagal transmitters. We put, stick a transmitter in the vagina of a doe, mm-hmm. and, then, and and so that's, you know, about over, a little bit over 100 degrees. And when the fawn is born, you do this before the rut, and the semen just swims right by the transmitter, and then of course it meets egg, and here comes the fawn, and then the fawn's born about 200 days later, and when the fawn comes out to birth canal, it pushes the transmitter out. And the whole purpose of this is so we know exactly where and when the fawn is born. The transmitter hits the ground right where the fawn is born. And we know this because it sends a different signal because it goes outside the doe, and the temperature changes changes. Right. You know, fawns are born spring. It's not 100 degrees outside. And we know it, it, it is, I mean, instantly, you know, when it slides out the vagina two inches, it sends out a different signal. Right. And that alerts the graduate students, because I'm probably in bed at the time, don't want to be woken up. The grad students go running out there and find that fawn. Usually within a couple hours, we weigh it, tag it. And this study was to see how, you know, how many coyotes were eating fawns. And, and oddly enough, about 70% of the fawns were dead before we got there. Coyotes killed them, literally, in South Carolina. Wow. And this one, this, this was not a small study. This is on 300 square miles. Not a small study. Wow. I could go on about coyotes all night long, but anyway. That's a shocking um, statistic right there. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's stunning. It's stunning. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. But anyway, uh, you know, and so we're able to take these actual birth dates and back date to the conception date. Deer have a known, you know, gestation period and, 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 and literally go from Michigan and Maine and Georgia and South Carolina and Texas and Mississippi and pull all this data together individually by state and all as a group and look at all the different moon phases and not even just moon phases, but declination of moon, the degrees north and south of the equator and all the school stuff. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal. The line could not be any flatter if we fake the data. There is zero relationship. Interesting. Oh, wow. Zero relationship. That's How many huge. millions of dollars have been made on moon calendars? Zero relationship. Now, here's the deal. There are some weather indicators, weather things, like wind speed and temperature. Temperature is a huge one. Mm. That do determine when deer are a little bit more active during the daylight. They're going to breed at more or less the same time of year, year after year after year, in the same location, if this adult sex ratio is the same. You change the adult sex ratio line 
lot. You can change the mean conception date. Okay. But let's say you're on state land, that, that sex ratio is not changing. They're going to breed within a few days the same year. But you may not see as much rutting behavior because one year it's 10 degrees above normal temperature. And these here got a great big old winter coat on. They don't want to run around when it's hot because they don't have sweat glands. They can't get rid of that body heat. You know, right. like we just take our coat off or we go drink more water or we sweat a lot. They can't do those except they can drink more water. So they just wait the nighttime to play. And the hunter goes out there in the woods and, you know, it's 80 degrees on opening day of gun season in Pennsylvania and he's seeing a deer and he says, my guy says, Dave's killed all the deer and the moon's, you know, whatever he's playing, whatever, because some people believe they breed more than a full moon, half moon, no moon, all these different theories out there. And, and what are the conditions are, he blames that. And it had nothing to do, but it's really hot. And, and you know, and next year at the same time, if it happens to be 10 degrees, and 10 degrees is, is a real number. That's about the magic number. You got normal and you expect normal deer behavior. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's use the word activity because that's better. And then if you're 10 degrees cooler than normal, you're going to have a heightened deer daytime activity because they're more comfortable, A, and they've got to eat to increase their metabolism because that's how they increase their body heat. They've got gotcha. to increase that big old metabolism in their gut, which throws off a lot of heat, and that's how they stay warm. But if it's 10 degrees warmer than normal, they're trying to get rid of heat. They don't want to eat and, and make more heat. It makes them very uncomfortable. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. That's, so uh, that... those are those are two things that you can always get a good argument going over is deer are not colorblind and the moon has nothing to do with when they breed. Right. So this is I mean this is a good argument. I mean these things have been out there for years and years and you've... years and years and years and still out there and, and I'm not going to convince everybody but there is great data out there. Right. Great data. I'm not a... one guy's opinion. Great scientific data. I'm a scientist. I'm... I'm a trained scientist going back to college. So I, I dig data like this. Um, I think this is great stuff. Um, you know what you know what the guys in West Texas always say, I do a lot of work in Texas, and they always say, man, we love it when a ruthless gang of fat steals a theory. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, it's fun and to sit in deer camp. I do the same thing with my buddies, and we all, you know, make up theories or, well, I think this, or I saw this, or my favorite story of all time, I, I don't remember any magazine, I wouldn't even say it if I did, but years and years ago, somebody killed this just giant buck about 50 yards from interstate somewhere. Probably wasn't even legal to hunt that close to the interstate, but 50 yards from the interstate. And, and so he wrote this big article, and his theory was that all the big bucks across America were living close to an interstate because hunters don't hunt there. Right. And every hunter ought to be hunting within 50 yards of an interstate. Can you imagine? and all the guns 50 yards from an interstate. <laughs> and, and whether big bucks live or don't live by interstate, be cautious when one person has one observation and then proclaims that as a rule. Right. You know, how many times you sat there, we all know turkeys have great color vision, but how many times have you sat there perfectly still and had a flock of turkeys walk by you when you got your hunter's orange on? Because oh, yeah. all these species of wildlife, their eyes are made to see movement way more than color because color doesn't kill them. Color doesn't kill them. Movement kills them. Right. When the bobcat, when the hawk, when the coyote, when the snake, whatever it is that's coming after them, it's moving. Yep. And God built their eyes to pick up movement. So you can sit there and saw it orange and a turkey walk by you, you go to pick your nose and the thing blows out at 100 yards. It's uh, it's interesting you say that because I've always felt that I could sit out in a field um, with some, some cover scent or some kind of, as long as my scent was right, but and I could sit out there in my three-piece suit and they wouldn't care as long as yeah. I stayed still. I, I'm a big believer in camouflage for turkey hunting. They have great vision and I wear camouflage when I'm deer hunting just to try to not to alert the squirrels and the blue jays and everything else so much so right. they're not cackling up the woods alerting deer but uh, I, really the best camo for deer hunting is a can of sit still. Right. I agree. Just, just, just don't move much. Yep. Yeah, it's one of those those observations you make over time but I, I, boy that's that seems to be spot on. Um, yeah. What? Uh, let's talk about food plots a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a place called Proving Ground, correct? Yeah, you know, we just call our farm. I, again, I live by Branson, Missouri. It's in the Ozark Mountains, and our and our land is, is just extremely rocky and really narrow valleys. When I say narrow, like 30 yards wide and really narrow ridge tops. Okay. I always said if I could take an iron and flatten my place out, I'd probably own about 3,000 acres, but it's all on the <laughs> side of a ridge where I can't do anything with it. Right. <laughs> so we just, you know, over the years, different companies have paid us to test seed or fertilizers or whatever, and kind of the theory is if it works here, it will work anywhere. And that's kind of where the name the Proving Grounds come from. Okay, gotcha. Tell me what's going on on the Proving Grounds. What are some of the, the things you're doing out there? Well, this year, as as far as food plots go, we 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 mess around a lot with different fertilizers, and and one thing we don't do here in eleven years we've owned this, we've never disc a field. That's a big statement. We've never disc a field. Man loves to plow dirt, disc dirt. It's just inherent. Garden, I don't know what it is. You want to turn dirt, right. and turning dirt's a really bad thing. You know, the native prairies were the richest soil known to mankind, right. and of course they were never plowed or turned until European settlers got here. Right. And, and when you plow or disc, you do several things. You allow oxygen 
oxygen to get way down, a lot of oxygen get way down in there, and that decomposes any organic matter. Organic matter is a really good thing. It stores a lot of nutrients. And, and also, when you disc, it, it allows any moisture in that top layer of soil to evaporate much quicker. Okay. And, and soil moisture usually, you know, rarely do we have too much unless you're on a really heavy clay soil. Usually, we're, we're dry. And then the third thing disking does is, you know, you think about the weight of the tractor and the disc, and it all comes down to like that little eighth inch edge on the bottom of the disc. Right. And so you're you're loosening the top, whatever, you know, three to six inches, but you're really compacting the ground right below that. And you make it so compact that water and, and the tree, the, the plant roots have difficulty going through there. It's called a hard pan. Okay, gotcha. And, and so like the more sophisticated farmers in more, of course, no-till drill. And for planting food plots, almost every county in America has no-till drills for rent or ridiculously cheap. It's another government giveaway, like seven bucks an acre, you know, to rent a $20,000 drill. Uh, I'm glad they do it, but that's certainly a waste of government money. And okay. and so, you know, I rent drills until I could afford to buy a used drill. Now I've got an old used till drill that we place parts on all the time. And, and we've tested this side by side, no-till drill techniques or conservation tillage, we call it, versus others. And we get way more yield and spend a whole lot less diesel fuel doing it. And then we play around a lot with different fertilizers, and we started using a composted, that's a big word, and humified, humic acid, chicken litter, or chicken poo-poo, and have just increased our yields dramatically. On my old rocky soil, there's no ag, folks. There's no, there's no soybeans, no corn for, for counties around me. You never see a grain truck going down the highway here. No silos. A combine would tip over on any hill here. There's no possibility of being a grain farmer. My best crop to date is 196 bushels of corn per acre, better than the Iowa's average. And, and, and yeah. to put that in scale, how, you know, doing better food plots is worth that the deer I shot this week shatters all buck antler records for the county. Oh, wow. By design, you know, by growing, by you know, setting out to grow the biggest deer in the county. Right. So I can't register in Pope <clears throat> Young because I, I, I believe in lighted knocks. I want to know where my arrow's going. I want to see my arrow's hitting the deer, and, and Pope and Young doesn't allow lighted knocks, but it, it would, it would if, if short of that, it would, it would be the record by far. Gotcha. Okay. What should, uh, what should just the everyday hunter know about a food plot? Yeah, you know, uh, I think that's real simple. If you're planting a food plot, you're either doing it to provide nutrition for deer, and that's, let's say, 10% of the food plot farmers, or you're trying to attract deer to an area so you can watch or shoot them or, you know, whatever the purpose is. Keep them on your land and not on a neighbor's land. That's a valid, valid reason. Right. No one likes to talk about that, but I certainly want to try to do that. So um, you, you select the two grizzly bear hunters. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You just got to be faster than your partner. Right. And, you know, because the bear's going to eat one of y'all, so, you, you know, you knock your partner to the ground, the bear eats him, and you take off running. And you don't have to have the best food in the world, but you need the best food in the neighborhood. Right. And, and the best food in the neighborhood may not be the best food in the neighborhood. It may be the best food in the neighborhood during the hunting season. So let's say there happens to be a 40-acre bean field next to you. Yeah. You're not going to compete with that. That guy's a professional farmer and all the big equipment. You're out there with your you know, your ATV and a couple of implements and a bag of fertilizer. But those beans are going to be harvested by mid-October or so, and those deer are wanting to eat. And now if you've got something that's green and fresh and looking good after mid-October, you've now got the best food source in town. And so that's, that's what we help a lot of people with is looking at the neighborhood neighborhood and then designing food plots that are the best food source during the time year they want to hunt. Maybe they're archery hunters, maybe they're gun hunters, maybe specifically they're late season hunters, Mm -hmm. you know, and and planting a variety that's good for that time of year because all plants go through a maturation process. Some taste pretty good early on, like a soybean comes out of the ground, deer love it. Uh, A brassica comes out of the ground, it's not as palatable for a while, like a turnip or a radish or something like that. So, uh, or you may want to plant a blend. If you want to hunt, you know, that's your one food plot, you're hunting on granny's 10 acres and you got one food plot, then you definitely want to plant a blend of plants. There are many good blends on the market to kind of have something that's kind of coming into its prime throughout the year or throughout the hunting season. Okay, gotcha. Um, if you don't have the ability to grow stuff, is an alternative like buying bags of corn at your local feed store okay to you know, feed deer? You know, we're legal. Certainly corn is, is uh, deer are addicted to corn. Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. Anywhere I work, we, we trap deer, you know, to put collars on them or whatever. <laughs> Sure. And I've never worked anywhere that within a week deer wouldn't adapt to a corn pile. Right. Uh, it, it's there's good and bad to that. Uh, you know, deer on a corn pile are are going to be nuzzed deer, and if one deer's sick, then it's just like your kid at a, at a kindergarten picking up a toy when Johnny just blew his nose all over. You yep. know, if one deer's sick, they're all going to get sick. So, and deer don't get sick much. So I'm not opposed to that. But in areas where CWD has been found, then that practice certainly needs to be limited. And that's not okay. everywhere. That's the minority of the deer area. But deer are such a valuable 
and precious resource that where there are troubles, we need to work with the agencies and, and, and try to reduce those troubles. Yep. Okay. Is, is corn a good food for a deer? You know, everyone either is on one side of that fence or the other. Boy, corn's no good or corn's great. It's kind of middle. Corn's a really good source of energy, mm-hmm. and it's digestible energy, so that's good. And, guys, people say corn's bad for deer. I mean, all throughout the Midwest, deer make a living on corn. I mean, they eat corn almost every day of their life. So to say corn is bad is, is clearly wrong from just obvious data. Okay. But deer on a corn-only diet is very bad. That will give them acidosis or eat up their tummy. You know, they need a good natural mix of protein and energy and fiber. And a little corn put out as an attraction. I put corn out during my camera survey every year so I can get the maximum number of deer in front of my cameras to see who's there and who's not, and amount of fawns that survived that year, whatever I'm looking for. And, you know, I think that's a great tool. Gotcha. So it's, it's a great it's tool. It's not necessarily bad. It's just, it's just It can nah. be a part of a diet, and it shouldn't be the only thing that it's eating, but it should it can be incorporated. I, I look at corn just like a gun. You know, if it's used right, it's a great tool. Can it be misused? Of course it can, just like lasers or anything else. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the trail cameras that you use. Yep, I use Reconyx cameras, and I'll just admit up front, they cost a little more than other brands of cameras. Uh, I'm a real frugal or cheapskate, if you want to use that word. So I'm always looking for value. And, and mm-hmm. I've, like now, as we're talking, I've got Reconyx cameras out in the woods right now working that have been there eight years straight. We never bring our cameras in. We're always, you know, year-round we're on some project. There's no need to set them in a closet. So year-round I have them out there. So, you know, wow. I'm going to pay a little more, but I'm going to get a lot more years' use out of them and better quality images throughout all all those years. And then the thing I like most, I mean, the, the camera works great, but the unknown of the Reconyx is uh, they have incredible free software. It only works with the Reconyx pictures because of the data format or the data file. Okay. Uh, uh, just the way the Reconyx stores data efficiently, you know, if you put another brand camera on there, it won't recognize that data file. But they have a way that's just incredible that you can, you know, it'll pull off the Google map for your area, you tell a few things, it'll highlight your farm, and you can track buck movements about as good as I can with a GPS call. And do, we use it for scientific research. I mean, we use their free their, uh, all the time and track literally hundreds of thousands of pictures of deer like that. And it's a tremendous hunting. Besides a research tool, for me, it's a tremendous hunting tool to start developing patterns. Hmm. That's so, uh, that sounds like. A I think f- you ought to give the cameras away and charge you for the software. That's how much I like the software. Right. That's really cool. So Reconyx is your brand that you trust the most. And did I hear you right? You said you leave it out there for. You've left some out for eight years. Yeah, I've got cameras in the woods right now that if, if they've been in in the house it was one day between going from one project to the next that's incredible i leave about year round my cameras never come in that's incredible yeah Absolutely. i use uh I, I, you know again being a tight well i've tried all kind of batteries and a couple things i'll share if you're going to use rechargeables which are great in a good conservation mood buy the best one you can get there's a german company that makes them they're like six dollars a piece but man i mean i've got years of service out of them okay. truly a value i think that brand is anman and and then the other best value i found is those energizer lithiums i'm not sponsored by either company mm-hmm. uh uh, the lithiums cost a little more, but last about five times more than they cost. I mean, I'll, I'll get, you know, almost a year out of a set of lithium batteries in a Reconyx camera. Gotcha. And, and so, and I've done the math, you know, versus buying a regular alkaline battery versus a lithium, because the lithiums cost more at, at Stuff Mart, and, and I've done the math, and even though they cost more, over the course of a year, it's a lot better value. Gotcha. All right. Very good to know. So we got to check out Reconyx. Here's some my, some questions that I have, and this is kind of silly. Um, but I've got to go back to the old cartoon that, uh, the posted sign, the deer reading the posted sign. Can deer read? No, I don't, you know, deer, deer can certainly learn, like I told, we mentioned earlier about the, the color and the, the padded feeder lid study, and we know deer can learn. Right. But they don't have near the level of intelligence a human has. Okay. There's no chance they can read. Right. Or even learn voice commands hardly. Uh, the, the, what they have, and, and I think this really messes a lot of people up, and a lot of, a lot of wildlife is, the, well, let's go back to, we talk about mythbusters. Yes. Everyone thinks that the rut's the number one driving force for deer, or food, or, you know, deer survive by their gut. You've heard all these statements before. Yep. Those are unequivocally wrong. Unequivocally. The number one driving force in a deer's life and what all hunters ought to plan their strategy around is fear. The number one driving force in a deer's life is survival every single day. Hmm. Bambi the movie got it dead wrong. They're not playing. They're not laughing at butterflies. They're surviving. Gotcha. And, 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 and you measure that by monitoring cortical steroids. The humans have, when we're under stress, our cortical steroid level will increase in our body in the same way with deer. So we can 
monitor deer uh, either with the GPS collar and then dart them in a pen and then dump some tiger urine. I mean, white-tailed deer have never seen tiger, never smelled tiger urine. You dump tiger urine in a deer pen, the deer will go crazy because hmm. they sense it's a predator. Uh, really? And, Interesting. Yeah. So survival is their number one gig. And so that's why I'm so crazy about reducing my scent. And that comes in a lot of ways. Like I take a backpack leaf blower before season Mm -hmm. and blow trails in hardwood areas to every one of my stands and all around the bottom of my stand. Because those leaves are spongy and they hold a lot more scent than just a bare dirt or where I live rock. Mm -hmm. And and you're making a big old scent trail walking through those leaves. And then think about it. When you step on, you know, let's say six inches of decomposing leaves, everyone thinks we don't want to do that because they crunch. I'm not worried about crunching. Squirrels make noise. Turkeys make noise. Noise, you know, everything in the woods makes noise. Yeah. But not many things are 200 pounds, like a hunter, 150 pounds, 200 pounds. And when you step on that big old wad of leaves with a size 11 boot, you're just going, you're just pushing out a huge amount of scent ball of crushed leaves all the way to your stand. Well, that's not normal in the woods. Right. You've got little skinny feet. They're, they're just kind of poking through the leaves. Right. And you're going, all the way to your stand. And I'm not talking about the noise. I'm talking about the scent you're putting out. Right. Stuff you and, can't and, see, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I'm saying guys will pay attention to you. So I blow a trail to my stand, and it serves many purposes. A, I can walk in much quieter. B, no hunter likes to admit this, but almost every hunter, if we were raising hands, would admit they've got lost going in for daylight to their stand. Right. And then they spend two minutes walking around with a flashlight shining over, where's that stand, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, where's that stand? Well, when you've got a blown trail, if you step off the trail, you know instantly you're not going the right way. Right. right. So you can walk Walk in with either no flashlight or minimal flashlight. You're not making any noise. You're not making any big scent dispersal. I believe in this so much that, like, right now the leaves are falling aggressively where I live here in Missouri. Mm-hmm. And they'll be all down in, let's say, two weeks or so. I'll take one day, do a lot of disturbance, and go re-blow every trail. That's a great tip. I've never thought about that, but that is that is so great. Yeah, and happy, I mean, almost everyone's got a leaf blower or some kind of blower in their, yeah. in their garage or neighbor's got one, you know. And, man, you can go in so silently. And people say, well, won't deer adapt to your trail? Yeah, but they don't smell you. I've shot a lot of deer walking right down the trail I blew in the woods. That's fantastic. Now, how far out from, from your entry point to the to the stand should you blow the leaves? Wherever I park the truck or wherever I get in the stand. The whole way, gotcha. The whole way. Could, a mile? You know, when I don't do that, yeah, I'm not walking a mile. Okay. There's very few whitetail places you got to walk a mile. Okay. Uh, and and when, and I have some land I hunt that's really close to public land, and I, you know a few guys can't read very well apparently, maybe cross that line. And so if I'm where other people are going to be, I'm going to go in the woods 20 yards from where I park my truck or so, and then blow the trail just so I'm not leading someone else to my stand. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, we had a question on the Big Buck Registry recently, and uh, a gentleman was in his tree stand and he was texting somebody, uh, his wife or something. And he noticed that as the deer approached, when he texted his buddy or his wife, that the deer actually looked up at him. Can deer pick up on a frequency of a cell phone? Yeah, there, there's there's no research to indicate that. I think they just saw him moving or, you know, I think there's a very simple explanation for that. Excellent. I, I like putting these myths to bed tonight. This is really Yeah, good. and you know, got to remember, a cell phone has what? A big old battery in it that smells totally unnormal in the woods. Now, I'm all about guys taking their cell phone for safety reasons to the woods. Yep. I take mine. I, I download books on mine and I, I read in the stand all the time. Right. And reading does a couple things because if I don't read, like I'm sitting there talking to you and if you can see me, my hands, I'm one of those guys that their hands got to move all the time. So I read and that keeps me still. I'm looking at my phone and, and, I, and I just look up every verse, or every chapter, or every paragraph, whatever I'm reading and kind of scan my eyes around and, you know, see if there's a deer. I detect most deer by smelling them or hearing them long before I see them. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, but yeah, but the phone keeps me, but I wipe my phone down with a, you know, a dead down wind white cloth or some kind of white cloth and try to get as much off because you know your human oil, your fingerprints, and everything are all over that phone for days on end. You've been right. sticking it up on your sweaty face, so clean that phone up right before you go hunting. And what uh, what else can we clean up? I mean, the phone is something you have with you all the time, so and that's probably one of those things you bring in the woods with you. That's not Man, natural. I clean everything. You know, okay. uh, my, my my hunting gear, uh, you know, again, I, I live where the wind swirls really, real bad. I, I go out, to, I try to draw a tag every year for, for Kansas. I love western Kansas because the wind comes off those rocky mountains. It's coming out of west today. It's coming out of west tomorrow. 20 years from now, it's going to be coming out of west. Mm-hmm. And the wind is so predictable. I don't worry that much about my scent out there because it's easy to hunt with the wind on your face. And the landscape is so open. I'll spend a day or two just scouting for every hunt. And I'm using my binoculars. Okay, here's the, here's the center pivot irrigation or the feeding field or the milo field or whatever. And here's the CRP. I know the deer are going from point A to point B, but I don't know how they're going, so I'm going to figure out which drain or creek, where they're using. And about day three, then I move in for the kill. Mm-hmm. 
I don't start off hunting. Here where I live, you can't do that because you can't see more than 50 yards. It's all timber country. Right, yep. And, and the wind swirls like crazy due to the, the topography here. Right. So I have a, a separate washing machine. I'm a real redneck. It's in my garage. I hook up a water hose to it. My wife hates <laughs> this. And and I use a biodegradable detergent, dead down wind, so it doesn't matter. And I just you know the effluent or the exit hose goes out in the yard. Yep. And, and when her lady friends come over, and I've got a little rack out in the yard, actually the bottom of a redneck tree stand, it's old, just a rack, and I put a bunch of wire across there as my clothes drying line. I got out in the yard, so I got my whitey tidy MO out there in the yard drying, and I got, you know, a, it looks like a sewer hose running down the driveway. It's not hurting anything. Yeah. And, you know, and, and my clothes never come in the house. They go in that wash machine, and no one else's clothes go in that wash machine, and my hunting pack and, and everything that's washable. I mean, almost everything that's in my arrows and my bow go through that wash machine, hang out on a sunny day in the dryer, then I use a scent master. It's a locker thing that has 130 degree heat going to it, a couple carbon filters, it's a closed system, it's not sucking in air from the outside, and, and all my clothes and gear, everything is in my bow, and I tried putting my bow in there, and I thought that's the coolest thing, except it melted all the wax off my bowstring. Oh, right, right, okay, gotcha. Yeah. But other than that, my pack, my, my binos, my rangefinder, everything goes in there. Okay. And and I got to tell you, and it's a pain, it's a real pain to do all this, yep. but when I started really taking it to this intensity level about three or four years ago, I cannot tell you how many more times I've had deer get downwind without busting me. Am I 100%? No, I've been busted. I've certainly been busted. But the chances of me getting busted in a really tough environment to hunt, have, have the odds have greatly improved in my favor. Right. That makes sense. I mean, it, it, the I've always seen, I've always had more success on the years that I focus more on my scent control. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a human. I get lazy sometimes and I don't do yep. that for whatever sure. reason. Um, could be kids or whatever, but sometimes I cut the corners and I do notice a result in the field um, about the number of deer that I actually interact with. You know, there's always that time when the wind's perfect and you could be sitting there doing whatever you want and the deer will still walk up in five yards because it just conditions are right. But remember, it's not only your stand location, but it's your approach and your exit. Right. You know, you don't want to alert the deer before he ever gets to you. So we know from GPS callers, and this is a really big gross average, deer are going to move about 200 yards every 20 minutes. Now, they could go 200 yards in a couple of seconds if they wanted to. But, you know, normal behavior, feeding, browsing, looking for predators, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're in your stand. If you're like I am, you can't see 200 yards in most places. And the wind swirls one time in 20 minutes. You could have a good deer coming your way and he never made it to you because your scent cone was a barrier he couldn't get through. So I want to reduce my scent as much as I can. And and there's some great research just come out. I'm a big reader from the German Air Force. I don't know why they're studying scent, but from the (laughs) German Air Force talks about all the things that help human scent molecules travel. The obvious things like the higher the humidity, the more it's going to travel, right? Right. And, and the more uh, liquid or porous the substance is, the more scent it can hold or give off. Like, you know, a solid steel bar doesn't give off a lot of scent. Okay. Uh, your bow, if you wipe it down with a good scent preventer, it's not going to be giving off a lot of scent. Mm-hmm. You and your breath, and, you know, we're uh, not to be gross, but all of us have, you know, billions of cells dying and sloughing off our body every hour. Right. So you wear those same hunting clothes, especially your, your underlayers, a couple days in a row, they reek. They may not reek to you, but they reek enough that any deer can pick them up a long ways off. So I want to reduce my scent as much as I can. And when that deer smells me, it may think I'm 200 yards off and it's only 20 and it's too late for them to figure it out. Gotcha. And I've had deer. I've got video of deer. We had a great one last year just because it was a muzzleloader hunt in Kansas. And, and we were hunting uh, and we were hunting an area that I knew it was between bedding and cover again. And I just knew this mature buck was passing through about a little four-acre native grass field. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd actually seen him there a couple of days but out of range. And we moved in and we finally got the wind right. And early in the morning, we started right down by the creek, so the thermals are going downhill, and we, being the cameraman and I, said that when when we feel this shifting, when the heat comes up, you know, 8 or 9 o'clock and on sun, and we feel the thermals going uphill, we're going to change and get above this deer. And I just jokingly said, we're probably going to be moving right when he comes out. And we're about 20 yards in our approach going uphill, and we're hugging the wood line, just kind of going through there, and both of us just said, there he is, and hit the deck all at once. And sure enough, on the opposite corner of the field, we see big antlers. And we just, we're right by the tree line, we drop down, I peek up over the native grass, and there he is. I mean, the deer, I've been, you know, I spent five days on this deer, and I thought, well, I just blew this. And so I get my gun up, cameraman's kind of getting around, and, and you can tell the deer's nervous. If you watch the show, you watch the episode, it's still online right now, you can tell the deer's nervous. We had literally 10 minutes and 30 seconds of that deer. Mm. And and you're thinking, well, why didn't you shoot him if you could see him? Because I could see his rack and his head, but the native grass is so tall, there's no way to push a muzzleloader bullet through there or any bullet. All bullets deflect without deflecting. I couldn't see the kill zone. Right. And so we're sitting there, and I'm thinking, this gig is up any second. His nose is up. You can clearly 
tell. I think it's a safe assumption that the buck knows something's up, but he just can't get enough of us to figure out where we are or how close we are. And he starts walking kind of toward us, and he makes it about 30 yards, and, and just there just happens to be a low patch in the grass right there. Mm-hmm. And at 10 minutes and 30 seconds, he met his maker. And and what's so cool is when I had a muzzleloader, you know how much smoke comes out of a muzzleloader? Right. The smoke goes straight from me to the deer. Right. Straight, the wind was going straight from me to the deer. He could not get enough of us to bust out of there. A very mature deer, 168 inches. Interesting. How? So I, I think we can reduce, we can't get rid of our scent because we're breathing, we're respirating. Right. But we can reduce it enough to get by with some stuff that we normally can't. How do you reduce the scent in your mouth? Can you, you chew gum? Do you use mouthwash? How do you, I, how do you I chew that? gum. Okay. I'm a gumaholic. I, I chew gum and I, I, you know, I don't, I just chew a brand off the shelf. It's not a special gumaflage or anything like that. And, yep. and I probably smell like spearmint or peppermint or whatever brand I pick up the day I'm going hunting, you know. Okay. And, and I just think that moisture in my mouth is better than bad breath developing or the hour, two or three hours of a hunt. Gotcha. So um, I, I, obviously I, I, I mouthwash and I brush my teeth and I floss. I do all the things your mommy taught you to do right before I go in, and then I'm chewing gum. Okay. And I'm well hydrated because a dehydrated person makes more odor. This is a little tip. A dehydrated person makes more odor than a hydrated person. Mm. A healthier person makes less odor. And and you don't want to hear this, folks. So this is this is nothing about any product. This is a safety concern. Some folks may know. I've had a kidney transplant 21 years. Okay. Uh, so, you know, every day is a really good day for me. I'm not going to get upset over much. Right. And health is really important for me. And and, and I've, I have my kidney work done, and every year I go for a checkup at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. So the most people think the pinnacle of healthcare. Right. And and through this process and talk to my doctors, they know I'm a deer researcher and what I do, they will tell you, Grant, don't use an antimicrobial. There's a lot of brands that are. Don't use an antimicrobial. You don't want to kill all the bacteria in your body. About eighty percent of the bacteria in our body keep us alive every day. Only twenty percent are bad. Right. Eighty percent we got to have to live. Right. We've got to have to live. Mm-hmm. And so when you take brand X antimicrobial and rub it all over your body, that's bad. And, and, and a chemical, you want to look on the back of whatever brand X you're using and make sure it's not in there. If you see Trickle 4 or anything like that, Trickle anything on there, don't put that on your body. That's bad stuff, really bad stuff. Gotcha. EPA doesn't monitor. You know, that's not a regula- regulated product. If it was, it wouldn't be on the shelf. Gotcha. Okay. Good tip. Very good tip. What about, um, can, can deer smell gunpowder? Yeah, I, I'm sure they can, but okay. do, here's a better question. Do deer associate that with danger? Right. That's, that's a better question, definitely. Yeah. So here's an example. I've got a bug in South Carolina. South Carolina is a tough place to hunt. I mean, the wind swirls, it's flat, very humid, scent carries, and the season's from August 15th to January 1st. Those are super educated deer. Legal to chase them with dogs all the time, bait them with corn. I mean, super, super educated deer. Yep. And I got a buddy that uh, is a really good friend of mine. He's got like a 44-year-old, I don't know how old, climbing tree stand he made out of conduit pipe. I swear I'm going to find a guy dead under a tree someday. <laughs> and smokes like a train. Right. I mean, the guy is the worst chain smoker you've ever seen in your a close friend of mine. I'm not bashing him. I worry about his health. Yep. And I always know where he hunts because where he hunts is all pine trees. He's kind of scared of heights. So he climbs about 15 feet tall and this old rickety climber and he smokes like a train and he puts his cigarette butts out. He puts the cigarettes out in the tree. <laughs> so you can always walk through the woods and figure out where he's hunting because there'd be a ring of cigarette butts at the exact height where he's at. Right. <laughs> and that's how I scout when I'm down there hunting with him because what was good enough for him was good enough for me type deal. Right. And the guy's a deer slayer. He'll kill about 15 deer a year with a bow where it's done season from August 15th to January 1st. He wow. is a master hunter, one of the best hunters I know of in America. Literally, he's not on any TV show. He doesn't endorse any products. He's a just loves to hunt guy. Yeah. I mean, he's a master. And here's what I think: he's never been busted by deer. He smells so much like cigarette butts. Right. He's been a chain smoker. He's he's my I'm fifty something. He's my age. He's been smoking since a teenager. He smells so much like cigarettes. And deer don't associate cigarettes with danger. Right. And deer just don't pay attention to him. I mean, his bow, his truck, his bow, his clothes, everything about him smells like cigarettes. I'm not saying this to be mean at all. No, but it's... And it's not worth it. Folks, don't do this. You don't want to die of cancer to go kill a deer. It's right. not worth it. But but so my point is, what deer associate with danger, they avoid. Right. We often hear guys, especially in the Northwoods, running a chainsaw and deer walk up to them because they associate chainsaws with fresh treetops in the winter and that's a source of food. Always. Right. Yep, I've yeah, seen that. or the feeder repeater, you know, in Texas or places where there's spin feeders mm-hmm. all over the place. Yep. You make the sound of a corn feeder deer are coming. Yep, I've talked to loggers and they and they just chit chat and they'll say, "Well, you should hunt right here next week because this is where we're going to cut." So what do you mean you're yep. going to be in your cutting? He said, "No, you don't understand. The, we're going to cut these trees and you're going to see deer in here every single day." Yep, yeah, absolutely true. Yep. Absolutely, especially in the Northwoods where there's a lot of sugar maple and whatnot. Yep, exactly. Absolutely true. Yep, absolutely true. So think about it. For most of us hunters, what we've done, everything we do is condition deer to 
avoid us. Think back to Pavlov's dog, old German researcher, and he fed dogs meat. I don't know why I had to use meat, but meat for 60 days in a row at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. On the 61st day, and he rang a bell at the same time. On the 61st day, he didn't feed him anything, but he rang the bell and they salivated. They were hungry. And that's the original research on conditioning. Well, most things we do as hunters condition deer to avoid us. Right. And, and so do deer recognize gunshots? No, I work on military bases and I often see deer. This is another little hint. He always feeding on the downwind side of these practice ranges where thousands and thousands of rounds of ammo were shot. Wild guys are shooting. Interesting. Because, it's, of course, they don't shoot deer. It's illegal to shoot deer. Deer have no fear of a weapon on most of these military bases, especially right by the gun ranges because there's no hunting there. Right. And then why would they be feeding downwind? because gunpowder is full of nitrogen and where it blows downwind or predominant downwind side is going to be better vegetation than upwind because it's getting fertilized with that gunpowder. Right. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I didn't think of it like that. Talk to us uh, just real quick and I'll, we'll let you go. And we really do appreciate you spending this time with us today. Tell us a little bit about how I can uh, use the rut to my advantage. Yeah, you know, the rut is, is is a great time of year to hunt. It's actually one of my least favorite times of year to hunt because, you know, early season bucks are patterned on food and cover, maybe water if it's dry. Late season, they're patterned on food. they got to find that food. Mm-hmm. During the rut, what they're patterning is receptive does and the does moving. So how do you pattern that? And to make that more complicated, the does not going, you know, she's going food cover, food cover until she starts feeling estrus come on. Mm-hmm. And, and if you've been married a long time, you, you know what's going to happen, but she's going to get cranky and change her behavior. Yep. And, and so she's, she's going to kick her fawns off because... So that's, that's just creator's way of making sure the fawns are around this big old buck that will do them danger. And she's going to go wandering by herself where she normally doesn't go. So you've patterned these does. And, and, you know, early season, you might find big bucks, early rut season, trolling the food trot. But late season, because does late or right during the peak of the rut, the does are changing their pattern. The hot does are rarely going to a food plot. They're trying to get away from all the bucks pestering them, so they're going to a thicket where all the bucks can't pester her as easy. So the rut is a more difficult time to hunt. So if you invited me up to hunt with you, I want to go during the rut because I don't know the area and I need mm. deer moving as much as they can move to have a chance of killing one. Gotcha. If I'm hunting my home territory where I know the food cover, the rut's the worst time for me to hunt because deer are not on a pattern. Gotcha. Okay. So it's, you know, there's a lot made out of the rut and a lot of deer are killed during the rut because guys are just sitting there watching power line. I like to hunt in a rut. I like to hunt crossing areas like a power line or something open where you can see a long ways. I especially like power lines or utility right ways because they're narrow enough that deer still feel like they're in cover and they cross them freely during the daylight hours. Gotcha. Okay. That's a good tip. As far as... Can I add one more thing to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. My favorite time to hunt the quote-unquote rut are when does are receptive. If you're in an area where fawn, female fawns reach about 70 pounds while it's still season, female deer reach puberty at about 70 pounds. Okay. It's not an age thing. It's a, you know, it's a body condition thing. Mm-hmm. So in Iowa, the whole state of Iowa is a food plot. So like 80% of their female fawns will breed. Much lower percentage down here in the sticks and rocks where I live because the nutrition's not that good. Right. But, uh, but enough of the fawns will become receptive. Our season goes to January 15th at a late season. Season, when a fawn becomes receptive, she's not wise like an older doe, and she's still coming to the food plot to feed every day. Okay. And the best way to kill a mature buck during the late season, especially on my farm, is at those food plots because most of the acorns are gone. Deer come to the food plot, and those fawns will come out at 10 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and, and, you know, if you're in an area where there's a bunch of fawns coming, one of them's going to be receptive, and there's going to be a mature buck in tow. And that's exactly how I tagged a, a very large Missouri buck last year. It was in that late muzzleloader season. Missouri has a late muzzleloader season. Season, hunting the food plot, 11 o'clock in the morning, here comes a fawn with four yearling bucks chasing her. And I said, no, no, no. And about four minutes later, here come the big old buck I was after. Gotcha. All right. That's uh, that's a great tip, too. As If we're um, being on the theory that uh, deer are trying to survive and that uh, they're, the biggest thing that you should understand is what the deer fears, is it better to hunt a stand or sit still than do a still hunt or a track for deer? Is there a you know, disadvantage? I think around? that depends on where you're hunting and your skill level. My favorite way to hunt is, I think, what you call track. I don't track deer. We don't have enough snow. Or it's mm-hmm. too rocky. They don't leave tracks here. Uh, but but what I love to do is stalk. Yep. And and I, but I'm not just stalking like, well, I'm gonna you know go walk in the woods today. I'm going to try to arrive. Let's say I want uh, my stalk is going to come down a travel corridor or perpendicular to a travel corridor more likely, but I'm going to end up at the food source 10 minutes before dark. And there's huge advantages to that. I'm stock hunting, but I'm really just getting to the stand 10 minutes before the deer are going to be there or right when the deer get there. And that way there's no chance of the wind swirling because that time the wind is steady and hadn't swirled all afternoon to put my scent everywhere. Okay. So uh, gotcha. when I stock hunt, I usually have a destination in mind and I'm going to get there right when the deer are getting there from the opposite direction. So I've never alerted the deer. 
So 90% of my stock, I'm looking and I'm alert, but I don't really expect to see the deer I'm after. Okay. And I'm going to end up exactly at the same time, hopefully, when the deer get there with about 10 minutes of shooting, either in the morning, like I'm going to be working my way to that food source. I'm not there an hour for and I bust all the deer out. I'm going to come in the opposite direction, and I'm going to be there right at first light so I can see if there's anybody in the food. Gotcha. And I stalk my way to it in an area that's not alerting deer. Or in the evening, I'm going to go through the acorn flat or whatever, but I'm going to end up at the food source, food plot, field, whatever it is, 10 minutes for dark because that's all i need to kill a deer just 10 minutes right so it's kind of like a, a long version of taking a walk to your stand yep okay and, and i would hunt like that every single day except it's a horrible way to film hunts right i think that's probably the mo- if you have the skills to move quietly and be disciplined enough not to violate the wind i'm constantly checking the wind the wind shifts i go the other way i don't say well dog on it i, I want to go to you know over here to my right i'm just going to keep going wind shifts i go the other way right that's an interesting point because you very rarely see uh still hunting or stalking on tv yeah you you know, because you don't build the story, the cameraman's twice the noise and, you know, more movement. And you're not coordinated. You can see the deer. He's behind a tree, vice versa. It's a horrible way to film hunt in, in timber country. But uh, And I put it like this, okay? We're not coyotes. Coyotes run deer down. They run through the woods, and they got such a tremendous nose. They cut the deer trail, and then, you know, and they just go to them. Mm. We're not coyotes. We can't do that. We don't have, we can't run like that. We don't have the nose. We're bobcats. Bobcats don't have near as good a sense of smell. Yep. And a bobcat, you've probably seen bobcats from your tree stand or whatever. They creep through yep. the woods. And what they're doing is getting to the destination where a squirrel or the rabbit or the quail is going to be at the same time. Right. They don't sit there all day. They know the, they know the habits of those animals, their prey species, and they're timing it just right. Well, our skill set, you know, because we can have good optics and we can learn to walk quietly, our skill set much more matches the hunting style of a bobcat than a coyote. Yep. And so we, if we're going to use that type of hunting, we need to hunt like a bobcat. And if you've ever watched bobcat, they take four or five steps and it's down. And when I'm stalking, I'm not moving constantly from point A to B. I mean, I'll, I'll lean up against this tree a while and kind of look and glass and I ease up the next tree and I look and glass. I'm, I'm hunting just like a bobcat. Right. Gotcha. Tell us uh, one last question, Grant, and then we'll let you go. Um, how healthy is venison? Oh my gosh. You know, that's, that's a great one to go to the Mayo Clinic website. Just type in Mayo Clinic and venison or something like that. Google that and that'll get you there. It's, it's really low in fat, obviously. That's, I processed the deer yesterday. We, my family consumes, I have two daughters and a wife, one, only one wife. <laughs> and, and and we eat about 10 to 12 deer a year, mainly does. Yep. We don't eat any beef for my health and my family's health. And and we process our own venison, and it's super healthy. Now, wild game has a little bit higher cholesterol than some other forms of meat, like fish. Fish will be lower. Other than that, it's the healthiest meat you're going to put in your body. Gotcha. And, of course, it's you know it's as close to organic as you're going to get. It's got no shots, no hormones. You know, it's it's just eating. And, and here's another great thing about deer. Let me take that one step further, because that's a passion of mine. I wish people processed their own meat or went to a good processor. I can't. I can't believe guys that shoot a deer and you know donated twenty dollars. I mean, if you got more than you can use, that's great. But man, that's great food for your family. And here's the greatest reason why: deer are very selective feeders, and they're free range in the wild, so they're gonna take a bite. You watch deer eat; they don't just go down there and mow every acorn. They're kind of picky, or they don't eat every blackberry. They're picky, or they, even in soybean fields, you see me this leaf and that leaf, and they skip twenty leaves in between. Right. That's because they can smell and see differences in the nutrient value of those leaves that are only getting the best ones. Where a beef cow is out in the pasture with 44 other cows and they've just got to eat what's there. Right. They don't have a choice. They're usually in a monoculture feedlot or something like that. Deer eating the healthiest leaves that are not impacted by insects or damage or whatever all day long every day of their life. And so they're, ta- they're, they're like the super healthiest human. They're only putting the best stuff in their body every day. That's so cool. That This has been one of the, the most informative podcasts we've ever had. And <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Um, hey, if your fans would, check out Growing Deer TV because we do this every week. Every Monday morning we release a new episode. And we will put all these links right in our show notes for our listeners. Um, how can people reach out to you if they want to contact you? You know, the best way is, is through Growing Deer. There's, a, you know, just an info Growing Deer. That will get to me. My secretary will see it and get it to me, and that's the best way. Or go to our Facebook page, Grant Woods. Guys, we, I can't do, I just physically can't, but I try to respond to almost every question on Facebook. Yep. So, and, and, and Facebook for us, I, 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 I got to tell you, I don't even have a personal Facebook account, but Facebook's a great way for me to help share the exact stage of the rut or what deer are eating or what's going on, because I still travel a lot, and where I'm seeing what I'm doing, and that's just my way to try to help hunters on a 
daily basis. I try to put an update out there every single day. And it's my Facebook is not, you know, hey, I just ate at McDonald's or I'm, you know, watching whatever. <laughs> I, it, right. It's 100% deer type stuff. Right, right. Or what I'm seeing in the weather, what weather trends I'm seeing, or if there's any research. Like I just posted some research about deer car accidents I just found today. I mean, if I think it involves deer hunters, I'm going to try to share it through Facebook. Yep, gotcha. So it's growingdeer.tv. You can go, yep, go no there. .com, just dot .tv, growingdeer.tv. Dot .tv. You can go there. You can check out all the, the research. You can see all the videos, all different types of topics. So you can go to your blog, um, frequently asked questions, uh, keep up with the rut, see what's going on. Um, one of the most informative and best deer websites we've ever seen. So I would encourage all of our listeners to go and, and check out what Grant's got going on. Um, any uh, parting thoughts, Grant? You know, with all this technical stuff said, one of my passions also is just keep hunting fun. Enjoy it. Don't get all hung up on all the technology. If, if it gets to where it's work, you need to back off a week and, and figure out we're doing this to have some fun. Right. That's a great point. And it's, we're out there to enjoy ourselves and uh, we shouldn't really make it work, even though we can probably make a profession at it as you have. Um, but it's still fun. It's got to be fun. You know, if it wasn't fun, I'd be changing jobs. There you go. Absolutely. Uh, well, Grant, this has been fantastic. And, uh, if if you wouldn't be opposed to it, we'd like to have you on again um, because I feel like we just barely touched the very tip of the iceberg here on all the things that you know about and and have going on on your on your website. So we'd love Look to have forward you. Look to it. That'd be great. We'd uh, we'll check in with you in a, in a little bit and have you back on. Thanks for your time. Very good. Well, I don't know about you guys, um, but I I'm just blown away. I have uh, pages and pages of notes. Um, this is very much like listening to the Deer Sense with Dean Van Uyr from Northwoods Common Sense uh, last week, uh, which can be found, our, our whole interview with Dean can be found at bigbuckregistry.com forward slash common sense, S-C-E-N-T-S, by the way, if you'd like to re- re-listen to that show. And uh, this, Dr. Grant Woods, uh, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, this has just been amazing. We've learned so much today. I have learned a ton. I hope you as the, the listener has learned a ton as well. And I, I'm really hoping that you picked up something today that's going to make you a better deer hunter. If you would like to reach out to us, uh, you can give us a call at 724-613-2825, and that's our our phone number, and you can leave a a message just if you want us to reach out to you. If you'd like to be on the show, you can leave a message there as well. If you've shot a big deer and you'd like to tell the story, just you can call and just ramble on as much as you want, and we'll edit it and put it on the air. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash big buck registry, twitter.com forward slash big buck registry. Our website is www.bigbuckregistry.com. And as uh, if you'd like to listen to more of our shows, you can always find us on Blueberry. Just go to blueberry.com, which is B L U B R R Y.com, and type in big buck registry, and you'll find us there. You can go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes, all lowercase. And you can listen to all of our shows if you have an Apple device there. So uh, this is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. And we'll see you next week right here. Can't wait.